Where did everybody go? I know they have one more minute, but. They're coming back now. I think you lie. There's nobody else here. <laughs> uh, well, it might be a private private tutoring session. We've got three people. Did everybody have a chance to review the article that I sent out, the one with the new staging for invasive cervical cancer? Yep. All right. Well, let's get started. So you guys just went over with Dr. Oliver a bunch of stuff about colposcopy and pre-invasive disease and things like that. So I won't re-go over all of that. Um, I will tell you that going through the prologues last night, picking out questions to go over, um, they're very heavily into the microinvasive stage one questions. So there were a ton of questions about the stage one microinvasion and what would make somebody one versus stage two and um, fertility sparing and things like that. So we'll go kind of over the newest cervical cancer staging stuff from the article. The biggest thing to remember is that with your prologues and your written boards and even your oral boards, honestly, maybe they may not be using these def definitions yet usually about three to five years after we change something that they actually reflect it in their questions. And so it may be that they don't actually have these this data yet. And what I think they'll probably do though, if they're writing new questions, is they'll put answer choices where you won't have to pick an answer between old way and new way. So they won't put both of the same answers on there because it'll be difficult to really determine if they're using old versus new. Um, and I would probably think that most of the ones that they'll do now based on the new staging will be test questions that they'll throw out because it's too new of information. They usually give three to five years for everybody to catch up. But we'll kind of go over the changes that have happened with the different stages. So stage one, so the big thing, and I think I have it here, here we go. So here are like the biggest differences with the old stage versus the new stage. So the new stage, essentially what they've done is they've kind of taken out the lateral extents of the definition. So the lateral extent, they don't look at it anymore. They basically just look at stromal invasion and so it's not like depth to this and then length to this. It's depth. They also in 1B have split it out to 1B1, 1B2, and 1B3. And they've added that two centimeter change. And we'll go over this a little bit more based on certain different um, studies that have been done looking at two centimeters at a cutoff, especially for fertility sparing. So that is why they've added the two centimeter in there. It also changes things somewhat as far as whether you wanna do things uh, with surgery versus with potentially doing chemo radiation. So they've changed that. They've also changed the three C and they've added in lymph nodes. So previous to this, lymph nodes were not in the staging criteria for cervical cancer. Um, because the cervical cancer staging was all based on doing things in the middle of nowhere. Hold on. Oh, please. Uh, 
uh, anyway, so based on doing things in the middle of nowhere and not being able to get certain things that would tell you about lymph node status. So we'll kind of talk a little bit about what they use now to talk about lymph node status, but we wanted the cervical cancer to be something that you would do in the middle of Africa or a jungle or something with just stuff that is very minimal as far as technologic advancements. So doing things before, either with a exam, with an exam plus a cystoscopy and proctoscopy, or with doing things like IVP, which will help you see how the kidneys are flowing and functioning, and a chest x-ray. So before you didn't use anything like PET scans, MRIs, CT scans to do your staging, it was all a clinical stage versus a surgical, surgical stage. Now they've changed it, and if you see down here, they say that you can use radiology or pathology make this three diagnosis, the stage three diagnosis. So it's not a surgical per se, because you can also use radiology to make that diagnosis. So if you are, for example, using radiology to make this diagnosis, you can say that she's got positive pelvic lymph nodes and that you're saying that because you used either a CT a PET scan or an MRI to make that diagnosis, it's a stage 3C1R versus a stage 3C1P, which would be pathology. I don't think they're gonna ask you any of that stuff, but this is more for the fact that they used to not have lymph nodes in our staging for staging for cervical cancer, and now they do. So at least know that now there is staging that includes lymph node status. The other thing that they want to mention is that the LVSI or lymphascular space invasion is not changing the staging and the lateral extents, which we just said. So the LVSI does not change stage anymore. Um, so these are kind of the different things as far as controversial issues, as well as the stuff they want to touch about the changes in the new staging. So stage 1B with the cutoff at 2, this is what I was talking about as far as doing fertility sparing options. Um, and so like, for example, a cone in stage 1A, 1 and a radical trigolectomy, the recurrence rates are significantly lower under two centimeters as a cutoff. So that's why they changed that in stage one and stage 1A and stage 1B. Um, and then again, we talked about lymph nodes already. The imaging for the parametrial involvement. So with imaging for parametrial involvement, it's really about the MRI. Imaging for nodal metastasis is really about PET scans. So that's why majority of the time, if we have a visible lesion, here anyway, we do both an MRI and a PET scan. So the MRI is to more look for the parametric involvement, the PET scan is to more look for the nodal involvement. And then I did add on here something that they touched about with these micromets. So we're getting more and more lymph nodes that are sent for sentinel lymph nodes in cervical cancer. So sentinel lymph nodes mean that you take just the first lymph node and you have them microsection it. So now we're getting micrometastasis in cervical cancer, just like we did in endometrial cancer, where we don't have good data at what that means. Because before, when you took a lymph node out or a bulk of lymph nodes, you'd cut them in half. If they look fine, that's it. But now you're doing micrometes and microsectioning, which brings up these isolated tumor cells and even these things called micrometastasis, which are not isolated tumor cells but they're not truly metastasis either. And we don't really have a good idea of what that means. We know most likely their prognosis is worse, but if it's just ITCs or isolated tumor cells, you don't really have a good what to do in those situations. Most people treat them as a positive node, but we really don't have any, anything to really tell us what to do as far as studies because we haven't done sentinel lymph nodes in um, cervical cancer as much as we have in endometrial cancer yet it is much more common. Um, the other thing that we're not gonna really touch about here because I want to do more like questions, but the other thing that um, just to touch base on is as far as our treatment for cervical cancer. So it used to be majority of early stage. So before stage one B2 would be treated with surgery. 
So either you would do a totally regular hysterectomy for a 1A1 or anything above that, you would do a radical hysterectomy until about you know, 1B2, between 1A1 and 1B2. A radical hysterectomy would include removal of that parametrial tissue, removal and kind of dissection of the ureters, dissection of the uterine arteries, um, but you would remove the parametrial tissue as well as a portion of the upper vagina. We were doing that laparoscopically and robotically until about two years ago when a study out of MD Anderson basically said that robotic and laparoscopic surgery for cervical cancer actually worsens outcomes greatly. So now any radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer is done opening in. Um, so it's much more of a more of a procedure, especially with the larger ladies. Um, it's a much harder procedure to do open than laparoscopically, but the data is pretty consistent now. A lot of um, retrospective data is coming out saying the same thing. Um, so I don't think we'll ever be able to go back and do laparoscopic or robotic radical hysterectomies for cervix cancer. We can still do it for endometrial cancer because we have multiple studies that say that endometrial cancer laparoscopically and robotically is just as safe as open. Um, but I don't think we'll ever go back and do it for cervix. So now a lot of people are potentially on that kind of cutoff where you thought you could do it surgically before. Now they're pushing more towards doing chemo radiation because there aren't really any studies that say one is better than the other at that kind of bulkier cervix standpoint. The other thing that we always talk about with cervical cancer, especially early stages, is if you have any risk factors for potentially having to have both. So if you do a surgery and then afterwards you have risk factors that make you have chemo radiation, the morbidity of that is extraordinarily high and very bad outcomes potentially and things like fistulas and things that are just bad for your quality of life. So if you can save someone from having both and just do chemo rads, most people tend that way. Um, any questions on that? Because the new staging is quite, it's complicated and probably you're just gonna have to look it up every time now, but I doubt they're really gonna quiz you on stuff. And if they do, it's gonna be, the answer won't be the same, like what you would do in the old way and the new way, it would be something wrong either way. So that way you could kind of figure out, okay, are you talking about the new way versus the old way? Because I could see eventually them asking you questions um, because of that, they like to talk about the fact that they're allowing to do PET scans and MRIs and things like that now. What's the cutoff? I know you said it, but say it one more time while I'm about when we have to do the radical hist, 1B1. So the radical hist is anything above a 1A1, 1A2, um, and then 1B1, 1B2, and potentially even a 1B3, but most people over four, they send those to chemo rads because the likelihood of having to have chemo radiation after your radical hysterectomy is quite high. So most 1B3s probably would go and do chemo rads instead of surgery. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all right. In the interest of time, we will get rolling. So these are all pre-og or prologue questions. Um, a 27-year-old woman um, with an inner uterine pregnancy at 12 weeks comes to your office. She has cervical cytologic screening that reveals a low-grade lesion. Colposcopy indicates CIN1. What is your most appropriate next step? C. Reassess postpartum C. C. That is correct. All right. So this is just blips from there. So essentially... If it's high grade though, you can still do the 12 week intervals. So it used to be back in the day, we did 12 week intervals for everybody. And so, but if it's a high grade, you still can do 12 weeks or you can also just defer to postpartum. So it really depends on what you believe in. The problem with cervical examinations when you're pregnant is the cervix looks completely crazy regardless <laughs> when you're pregnant versus, you know, if there's any dysplasia there. So can you tell the difference between dysplasia and just a normal pregnant cervix, sometimes you can't. So what are the, some of the things that you definitely don't want to do in a pregnant cervix? ECC. 
ECC is the biggest one. So ECC is the one where you definitely should not do that when pregnant. What do you think about biopsies? You can do biopsies of the cervix um, during pregnancy that just might bleed more. Okay, so if you had a patient, you saw something that looked low grade, would you biopsy that? No. Not. No. So you save your biopsies for if it's high grade. Um, so definitely you can biopsy, but as Udi said, make sure that you're prepared for possible bleeding. So make sure that you have all the hemostatics, make sure that you are kind of prepared just in case bleeding can arise. But you can biopsy in pregnancy, it's just bloody. Okay, 35 year old woman comes to your office with gross hematuria, history notable for stage 2B cervical cancer for which she was treated with whole pelvic radiation and radiation chemotherapy. So essentially with this patient and with cervical cancer, um, chemo radiation, whenever we talk about that, we actually talk about radiation being the backbone and chemotherapy helping the radiation get more sensitized. So it's really the chemo is making the radiation work better rather than the chemotherapy being the big thing. And so the chemotherapy in these cases is actually weekly as opposed to a large chunk every three weeks, which is what the majority of our chemo is. So it's weekly chemo that helps the radiation work and the radiation is daily. So that is kind of a daunting thing for a lot of patients. And especially when patients are younger and they possibly could have problems with sexual function afterwards and things like that, radiation is kind of a bummer. Um, but we do know that if you can't get nice negative margins on your surgical specimen, you're going to need both, and those outcomes are worse. So it's, that's kind of how you have to counsel patients. Yeah, we could try and take it out surgically, but there's quite a high likelihood you could have to have the radiation anyway, and then you have problems with fistulas and things like that. So anyway, so the likely cause of her hematuria, knowing all this, is what? Okay. A. So it's radiation cystitis. So whenever anyone is done with gynecologic cancer treatment, we always talk about uh, survivorship and what to watch out for and bleeding of any kind from the bottom is bad. And so these patients will come in concerned about having bleeding. And the majority of the time, it's actually from their, <laughs> hi cat, their treatment. Um, as opposed to a recurrence, but you always wanna rule that out as well. Um, so hemorrhagic cystitis is the most common late term complication from radiation. So it's one that can happen many, many years down the road, even up to you know 20 years down the road, you can see it. Um, basically they have tiny, tiny telectanges from the radiation um, and that leads to hematuria. Um, so yeah, again, they can range all the way up to 20 years afterwards. So if a patient comes in with bleeding, you don't want to necessarily just jump to, oh my God, they've recurred, um, because it could just be from that. Um, they also have the potential to have worse cases with worse comorbidities, such as diabetes and things like that. Okay. 34 year old Nilagravid pap test has HSIL on exam. She has a normal appearing cervix. So no visible lesions is essentially what they're trying to tell you there. Colposcopy shows acetylwhite changes at 12 o'clock with mosaicism. So after your discussion with Dr. Oliver, what does that mean? What does mosaicism mean? What does acetylwhite changes mean? Abnormal blood cells is the mosaicism. It's the basket okay. pattern. Hmm? The basket weave pattern? Or yes. Is that what you said? Okay. So biopsy has microinvasive cancer, two millimeter depth of invasion. So you have a biopsy. So now what do you do? Well, you would ask her about her future plans for fertility. Okay. What are you trying to get out with that? Well, she's 34 and she's null up. She's got microinvasive cancer. It's two millimeters. So on a biopsy. 
What's your next step? Oh, you're going to do a comb. There you go. <laughs> so I get what you're getting at. I get what you're getting at, but you miss a step. So the issue is, and it is cone. I thought that that was a biopsy. Awesome. Yeah. So you just have a biopsy, especially if there's no visible lesion. You need to make sure that you don't have anything else there and you need to figure out exactly how much is there. Now, with the new staging, because they only look at depth, could you potentially get away with it? Not really, um, because you still want to make sure, especially um, with certain um, cervical cancers, such as adenocarcinoma, for example, that you're not missing anything deeper than what you can see on the surface on the X. Um, and so like you were already touching, touching, um, on is the fact that it depends on what her fertility options are. So say you do a comb, negative margins at little two millimeter spots, the only spot that's there. So technically it should be a one, a one. So what could you do after that? You could go back and say, okay, you could have a simple hysterectomy at this point, or you could just have the cone, which is what you did and be done. The issue with that is one, is it a squamous versus an adeno? So are you worried about things being in other places that you didn't sample because of skip lesions? Two, what's your marginal status? And three, do you have LVSI? So LVSI is lymphovascular space invasion. And they talk about this here. Um, and the risk of nodal metastasis for patients with 1A2 or non-visible lesions can be up to 8%. So that's kind of high. Um, and so whether or not you add lymph nodes, say for example, you do a simple hysterectomy with lymph nodes versus doing a radical hysterectomy versus doing you know, a radical trachelectomy, blah, blah, blah. And this is kind of what talks about that. Trachelectomies are extreme in these cases are different than trachelectomies where they've already done a super cervical hysterectomy. Oh, there's somebody else's cat. Is that a cat or a dog? It's a cat. <laughs> um, super cervical hiss um, is different than doing a trachelectomy and leaving the fundus behind. And so very few people actually do that now. We send all of ours to uh, University of Wisconsin and Kushner because they do the majority of the ones, at least around here, because it's a completely different procedure. And you also need to be able to have, you know, the cerclage and all the other stuff. Um, and it's really difficult to counsel these patients. And this is why it's a really long discussion about what this means for your fertility, because you could potentially say you have, you know, your fundus and your lower end segment and your cervix are all this amorphous thing. Like, yeah, we call them different spots, but are there really different? Like, do you have a line in your body that says this is where the cervix ends and this is where your uterus starts? No, you don't. So if you do the trachelectomy, what happens if you have a couple of rogue cells right there at the bottom that decide to like hang on and latch on and start growing? It's always a possibility. What's your risk of potentially being able to carry a pregnancy? Yada, yada, yada. So, but getting back to what Kelly was talking about, you could offer her a simple hysterectomy or a cone, and yeah, if that was it. All right, five centimeter cervical mass on clinical exam. So she has a visible lesion. So she's already out of the one A's, that's gone. Uh, there's no vaginal involvement or rec and rectovaginal exam reveals no parametrial or uterosacral involvement. Biopsy shows invasive squamous cell carcinoma with LVSI and a deep margin of at least five millimeters. What do you wanna look at for lymph node involvement? So this is prologues, which means they're not talking about new staging, but I think it's pretty much the same either way. Based on the sensitivity that we talked about at the beginning. The PET, B. The PET, yeah, the PET. So the MRI is if you were looking at Parametrial involvement, the PET scan is the answer if you're looking for nodal involvement. Um, and this talks more about that, about the sensitivity and specificity of PET versus MRI. But again, if we're really talking about old school staging, none of that was supposed to be done. So none of that was supposed to be done because if you're in the middle of Africa, you don't have any of that. So that wasn't supposed to be done back in the day but now it is. The other thing is they also like to ask you the least 
expensive options uh, because they like you to be cost effective. So they may try and trick you with questions that make it sound like they want you to pick the imaging. Well, actually the imaging is not the right answer. It's actually doing the minimal thing. So like, for example, with our other staging, we don't do imaging unless there's a problem with either the CA125 or patients having actual physical problems. We don't do imaging every three months because that's extremely expensive and you actually don't pick up anything new um, that you can't find on physical exam because guess what? Our physical exam actually is still pretty good at finding things. If you actually, you know, touch a patient. Okay. A 36 year old comes to your office with post-coded bleeding. She has not had any medical care for 10 years. This is how most normal cervix cancer patients present. They were told that they didn't have to have cervical exams or any pap smears or anything like that after they were done with their last baby. Their last baby was 30 years ago and now they're here with cervical cancer. This is why when Dr. Oliver said that the stopping at 65 thing is very nerve wracking, I do think that's the reason why ASACP said, you don't have to stop. You can stop, but you don't have to stop. Um, on specular exam, you have a five centimeter friable mass with extension into the upper third of the vagina. The biopsy reveals in invasive squamous cell. Rectovaginal exam shows no parametrial involvement or invasion into the rectum. Office cysto shows no invasion into the bladder. Wouldn't it be nice to do office cysto? I would like to do that. Okay, chest x-ray is negative. So this, what they're describing here, this is the way you were supposed to stage people clinically way back when. So this is pathognomonic of what a staging would be if you were 10 years ago or even five years ago, honestly. Um, chest x-ray is negative. It's now, now, now it gets dicey because now I'm talking about a pet. PET scan shows enlarged lymph nodes and periodic lymph nodes. So the stage is, okay, so pretend this is old school way. They're throwing the PET scan in there to confuse you because old school did not have lymph nodes. So what would this be old school way? So she's got five centimeters. So at least a 1B two, right? Because it's above four centimeters at least. But then you've also got extension to the upper third of the vagina, but no parametrial. And Is it no B? Parametrial. I, I think it's A, right? Because like the older staging was, like it's definitely a, oh, not, sorry, two, it's stage two. Yes, so old school way it would be stage 2A2 old school because of the upper third of the vagina. Or if it was new school, what would it be? With a specific and periodic lymph nodes. 3C2R? 3C2R, yes. 3C2R. That's why it gets confusing because you have to determine whether it is because of pathology versus because of radiology. I know because they're wankers and they couldn't keep anything just the same. Um, but what I'm saying with the whole questions is I don't think they'll put both of those answers on there. I think they'll put either B or they'll put the 3C2R because they won't want to confuse you as to which staging criteria they're using. So I don't think they'll put both those answers on there. They'll either put one or the other. Uh, yeah, I think I didn't put anything on there because the description was basically all the staging stuff we already talked about. Uh, okay, 27 year old, another gravid, pap test, and everybody is young too in the CREAG things. Like the prologues are all like under the age of 50. Like where are all the 60 year olds who come in after never having an exam for 30 years? Uh, 27 year old, another gravid women, pap test showed atypical glandular cells. Follow up copo and biopsies and endocervical curatage indicate at least AIS. Final path from a cold knife cone showed invasive, invasive adenocarcinoma with a diameter of five millimeters and a depth of two with negative margins and no LVSI. Next step. There's a lot of consternation going on. Everyone's faces are like this. 
So, I mean, she has cancer. We have the cone. So, but she's not cured by just a cone. I think she needs a tracheolectomy or a simple hist. Why are you saying that? What stage is she? Two. Oh, one A one. Yeah. Are they cured by a cone? One A. They are cured by a cone. So she's making margins, and no, because she's five millimeter, right? It's, it's three. It's between three to five, and she's five, so she's not right. one A. So she's one A one. It's one A one. Oh, because it's less. Hold on, I thought it was one A two because she's five millimeters. I thought greater than. Three, three to five is one a two. That's depth, not diameter. The five is the diameter, and her depth was two millimeters. Right. I didn't see that so part. this, this video thing yep. over there. Yep. Okay. So this is new, and they took out diameter because of how confusing it was. So they took. Uh, what was her depth then? Two. Oh, I didn't see. Two. Okay. Uh, let me go back. Where'd it go? Here we go. Yeah. So depth of measurement was two. They took out diameter because that was confusing everybody because it depended on, so back in old school, depended on what, honestly, it depended on what like thing you used. If you used up to date versus you used a different staging, some had less than or equal to, some had just less than. And so they took that all out because it just, it didn't mean anything. Like the diameter didn't mean anything unless it's a visible lesion. It didn't mean anything. So they took it all out. So yes. She is cured because she's a 1A1. Negative margins, no LVSI. You just put her on routine surveillance. Now, could you offer her after that, if she was done with childbearing, you could offer her a simple cyst, hist, excuse me, a hist to be completely done. Um, you would not necessarily need to use lymph node dissection because there's no LVSI. But even back before when we talked about how the risk of lymph node metastasis is still anywhere from two to 8%, it makes people nervous. And so sometimes they just do the sentinels, especially since now we're doing sentinels, one lymph node is not gonna kill anybody. And so some people are doing them anyway, but technically speaking on the exam, you don't need to. Okay. That was basically the patient that you and I did the cone on last week. Like she had it, it was treated, she had her cone, it was gone. And then on her routine cervical cancer screening, it came back again. Yep. Ah. Which is why it makes me super sad. But to that point though, she was also an adenocarcinoma. And you never, like, even if everything is negative, could you miss a skip lesion? Not saying that you, that we'd be wrong doing this because you 100% are correct in doing this. But can you predict if you missed a skip lesion? You can't. And so that's why I think what happened with her, honestly. I think, especially since it kept being the endocervix and the deep margin, I think we, I think a skip lesion was there and it wasn't gotten with her two humongous cones to begin with and then her third cone and then her fourth cone Ugh. all right 31 year old woman comes to your office vaginal bleeding on exam she has a friable cervical mass extending to the pelvic sidewall and palpable supraclavicular lymph node biopsies of the cervix and lymph node confirm squamous cell pet shows extensive hypermetabolic pelvic disease periodic lymphadenopathy multiple lung lesions, and a supraclavicular lymph node. She wishes to pursue treatment. What do you do? Chemo radiation. Anybody else? So she's chemo. So she's chemo, and the reason being is because she's got widely metastatic disease. So she's got a stage four so backing up, surgery for early stage, middle-ish and other stages is really radiation, chemo radiation. Stage four is chemotherapy. And the question marks now are gonna be those stage threes with, possible, with positive lymph node um, involvement. So we had a study called the Outback Trial, which looked at chemo radiation versus chemo radiation plus four cycles of chemotherapy. That is not back yet, but it's looking like it may not matter, the four cycles of chemotherapy. And that's gonna be a big question mark as far as with these patients, whether you do chemo radiation therapy regardless. But in her case, 
she's got a supraclavicular lymph node, which means that that is not going to be shot by any type of chemo radiation that you have. So you have to get that with chemotherapy. So she's a chemotherapy uh, patient. She also, because she's a stage four, will not do well. These patients do not do well. It's one of those, it's the same thing as kind of endometrial. If you catch them early, great. If you don't, not good at all. Very, very bad. So chemo. Um, and like, for example, chemotherapy often shorten, often results in short duration of response, but the overall survival in patients with stage 4B cervical cancer is only a year. One. It's very, very, very sad. Okay. 38-year-old multiparous woman comes to your office with vaginal bleeding at 16 weeks gestation. She is found to have a three centimeter friable mass confined to the cervix. She undergoes a biopsy, which shows squamous cell. Clinical staging workup shows tumor confined to the cervix. After extensive discussion, patients say she has no desire to continue with the pregnancy, request definitive oncologic management. Most appropriate management is what? three centimeters, so nothing else, no extension, anything like that. So it should be a 1B1. It's D, right? It's D, yeah. It is D. Okay. So rad hist with pelvic lymphadenectomy and fetus in situ. So you can do this. Question. If mm -hmm. we did that, I have a stupid question. If we found this in like this date and she's 16 weeks, you have to still like go through all of the abortion stuff with her? I have no idea because I've never had this happen in this state. God. <laughs> so, but I was in curious. Minnesota, you don't need to, but I don't know what it is in this state. Um, I would assume not because it's life-threatening for mom to continue the pregnancy. I would assume not, but again, I have not had this situation. I had a patient who was pregnant with this, but she wanted to keep the pregnancy. So we ended up doing the cesarean rad hist. So, and she's the one who lost her leg. Um, yeah, anywho. So yes, but the answer in this case is this, um, if they do not want to continue the pregnancy. Again, this is where it talks about, you know, patient autonomy and what they want to do and all that stuff. And that's a lot of counseling. And we have every, every extreme, extreme from just like this, don't desire to continue the pregnancy, want to get it taken care of, want to treat their cancer to even if the cancer looks like potentially she should really consider to terminate the pregnancy. They don't. And then they treat their cancer through the pregnancy and all the stuff with that. So um, yeah, don't, don't radiate, <laughs> don't radiate at this point. Yeah, not good. All right. Uh, this is a nice little chart of what to do pre 24 weeks and post 24 weeks. So sometimes if you get to the point where it's post 24 weeks, but it's not yet time to deliver. So say you're 25 weeks then you have to do a lot of very close monitoring, which is what we did in that patient. Uh, very close monitoring. Sometimes you have to consider doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, potentially. So yeah, it just overall sucks. All right, 57 treated with cisplatin-based chemoradiation for stage 2B cervical carcinoma. Um, 13 months after completion, she had a central pelvic recurrence and undergoes total pelvic exempt. Final path shows two positive pelvic lymph nodes. That is bad after an exempt, BT dubs. Negative surgical margins and poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. A, the prognostic factor that is most consistently predicting poor outcomes in this patient is what? Histology, high grade, time to recurrence, or prior treatment. Time to recurrence. Time to recurrence is always the answer. It is always the answer. Because if that those suckers were affected by the chemo and the radiation, they wouldn't come back so fast. So she basically, now it's 13 months. That's still good. It's not six. Six months is usually our, our really bad one. So six months, cut off. Anything less than six months, very, very bad. Anything more than six months can be okay. Um, but the fact that she had lymph node involvement with the exent, so... 
this actually talks about exoneration, what it means, what it is, etc. So total exempt is essentially the entire pelvis. So that includes part of the colon, it includes the vagina, it includes the rectovaginal space, it includes the bladder, it includes the uterus, it's still there. It's basically all of this stuff. The issue with exempt is that it is very very, 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 very morbid. So at the end of this, you have no parts. So you have a bag for pee and a bag for poop. You also potentially either have a new vagina created with some other tissue of your body or no vagina whatsoever and just a Barbie doll. So it's a lot of counseling before doing this. The majority of the time, we don't really do this anymore for cancer because you want to make sure that you don't have anything that they possibly could recur after this, this procedure. Like this procedure is the end. You don't want them to go through all of this, have no pelvic organs and then recur in six months. Like that is not good because in that six month window, you might still be dealing with the side effects from this damn thing. So you wanna make sure that while you're doing it, there's literally almost no way they can recur. And so if they have any type of nodal involvement during an exempt, at least where I trained, we stopped. Like if we went in and took out nodes and sent them to pathology and they were positive, we stopped because there was too much of a risk for that nodal involvement to mean she could have distant metastasis and it was not worth putting her through all of this. We much more do these with patients who have symptoms from other things. So either horrible, horrible pain, um, if they have fistulas, if they have other things from their radiation, then we do these much more for palliation rather than for actual, why does this person keep paging? Hold please. For actual like cancer treatment. Can you call this number to answer this page? <laughs> It's uh, the transfer's nurse who's now called me five times this morning. Why? <laughs> five times. All right. Anywho. How many so, exempts have you, like, do you do in a year, would you say? Exempts? Like, true total exempts? Yeah. Maybe one, maybe. I think I've done three since I've been here. Okay. True total exempts. So, anterior exempts, much more common. Anterior exempts are much more common because of the fact that the bladder and the uterus are kind of very contiguous with each other. Um, so much more common for an anterior exempt. Um, we do posterior exempts. So that's uterus and rectal area for more for rectal cancer than for our cancer. So the uterus is actually involved with the rectal cancer. I actually just did one of these a couple of weeks ago. So that's much more possible than doing the total. The total is very, very rare. Um, but this again, it kind of talks about, look at like the, the 50 people who underwent exoneration, one to three die of operative complications. So that's out of 50. So one to three out of 50 died just post-op. 15 to 25, so about half are cured and the other half die of recurrent cancer anyway. So it's just sucky. It's like, why would you put yourself through all of that to then have 50% chance of dying anyway? Yeah, it sucks. All right. Rad hist, BSO, pelvic lymph node dissection for 1B1 cervical cancer. Final path shows small cell. So this is very rare. All resection margins are negative for tumor. Nodes are negative. What do you do? Everyone's cats. <laughs> All right. So if it's small cell, which small cell is more aggressive, just guess. Chemo? Chemo, exactly. Small cell is bad news bears. Very, very bad. It is very, very rare though. 
It's also called neuroendocrine tumor. So neuroendocrine tumor and small cell are the same thing. Um, they're about one to 2% of cancers. Um, they have the worst prognosis. Um, they're usually early stage, but you wanna give them chemo anyway, basically because of the fact that nothing works. And if they recur, they're basically screwed. Um, so yeah, so it's chemo. Okay. Any questions? All right, go have lunch, be free, do fun things. Get your cats out of your face. Hmm? Get cats you out of your face. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Thank you.